Sunday. <laughs> We're glad to be with y'all. That's a timely, um, that's a helpful video to talk about just our time and our attention and our focus being given to God. One of the best things about Sunday is that we get to do that here, that we get to block out whatever's happened the rest of the week and set aside our time, our attention, our focus, our energy on this moment to learn about God, to reflect on God. And one of the ways that we do that is through singing. So if you're able, we want to invite you to stand with us and we'll sing this morning together. your kingdom come and father let your will be done on earth as in heaven right here in my heart father let your kingdom come and father let your will be done on earth as in heaven right here in my heart on earth as in heaven Right here in my heart Give us this day our daily bread Forgive us, forgive us As we forgive the ones who sin against us Forgive them and lead us not into temptation But deliver us from the evil one Let your kingdom let your kingdom come, and Father, let your will be done, on earth as you hear me, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come, and Father, let your will be done, on earth as you hear me, right here in my heart. Give us this day, give us this day. in a guitar string, so we, uh, can we pull an audible and yeah. flip-flop things real quick? <laughs> right. To be in your presence uh, as your people. Thank you that you've made us your people. That is not something we've done, but you've done it. That, uh, as we've seen in Colossians, you transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Thank you that we can celebrate that through song, uh, through baptism in a moment, through the um, just attention we give to your word, that that gospel not only um, is about our salvation and knowing that our eternity is secure with you, but 
but the, um, the gospel speaks into our family and marriages um, and parenting, being a part of a household as part of your household. And so we pray that you would have our attention, our affections would follow this morning, be glorified in everything we do, say, sing, share, uh, consider, and that we might walk out of here uh, encouraged and equipped as your ambassadors to reflect the love, the grace, and the mercy of Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. So you guys can be seated. Um, I want to welcome you to Allen Bible Church. Glad you're here to worship with us today. Uh, it's a special day, as you can see right here. Um, I'm not going to be taking a bath. We're going to have a baptism uh, in a moment. If you're a visitor with us, I want to extend a special welcome to you. So some of you may be here to celebrate um, the baptizee um, this morning. And so we're glad you're here. But if you're visiting with us, we're here the first couple of times. If you grab the um, connection card and the seat back in front of you and fill that out and drop it in the metal box uh, on your way out, or you can greet one of our welcome team in the lobby at the welcome desk. Uh, we'd love to get to know you, meet you. Um, and so thank you for doing that. That just helps us in our desire to extend our welcome beyond today. Uh, if you are newer, we have our next discovery class next Sunday. We do need to know that you uh, intend to come just so we can prepare materials for you. Um, and this, what this is, is to hear more about the vision and values of Allen Bible, but it's also a chance for us to get to know you uh, and who you are as you consider, hey, would this be a place we'd call home? Uh, this is a, a first step in that if you are seeking membership, but it doesn't obligate you to that. So just our invitation is to, um, to sign up today, right now, or in the next day or two, so we can welcome you as well as possible and look forward to, to seeing you uh, next Sunday. Uh, we also remind one another, uh, if you're part of our church, to give as part of your worship. You can do that in that box. You can text to give, go online. You can mail it old school to the office. There's four, the four options uh, up there for you. And then we have a, a special opportunity to give. Uh, one of the things that our vision is to live deployed as Christ ambassadors among our neighbors, the nations, and the next generation. And our women's ministry and our kids' life, which is our first through fourth graders, are teaming up over the next several weeks, and we want to invite everyone here to participate in some way. Um, and that is uh, to support our missionaries, Allen Bible missionaries in Romania, uh, Emily and Remy Durta. Uh, and they are leading uh, summer camps uh, th with Levada Orphan Care over there. And so our Kids Life kids are going to get the opportunity to hear more about that. What does that look like to be a missionary in another uh, country? Uh, and then what are the needs? And then we're going to be collecting over the next two Sundays, not today, but starting next Sunday, April 28th through May 5th. There'll be a green bucket, I've heard, that'll be in the lobby next week, um, where you can bring hygiene items, uh, candy that doesn't melt, um, some small toys. We're going to put together goodie bags to give to those kids. I can tell you, having gone to Romania twice and going to these camps, um, when you give them this, it is, it is like Christmas Day on steroids. It's such a beautiful thing. It will bring them to tears. But we want to do this as a way to uh, be a support and a partner with uh, Emily and Remy there and the continuing ministry. They've been there for years. They're investing in the long term in the lives of kids from broken homes. Um, and so there's an opportunity for us to be a part of that. If you've got a kid in that area, make sure you encourage them and have those conversations with them. Why would we give? Why do we share? What, what's going on with kids in Romania? It's a great opportunity. And there's the website you can go to. That has more information in case I botched it up here. Um, you can go to the uh, Pack and Pray on our allenbible.org. Just encourage you to give. And now we're going to move to uh, a baptism. So I'm going to invite the Farnums up. I want to mention really quickly, uh, baptism, just so you know, um, in terms of how Allen Bible thinks about baptism, the Lord uh, calls us uh, to be baptized and to, but, but baptism doesn't save us. Baptism is really a symbol or a picture on the outside of what's already happened on the inside. That as um, any of us have believed in Christ, we are new creations. The old is gone and the new has come. And yet he also calls us to be baptized so that we let others know publicly. And there are many reasons. Uh, I'm going to let, I'm going to save it for y'all to share why your reasons are you want to be baptized today. Uh, but, but also you'll hear as um, John baptizes his son, that the picture from Romans 6 is that we've been buried with Christ in the likeness of his death, and he'll go under the water and raised to walk in newness of life. And so this is a symbol. The water isn't washing away sin. Those sins have already been paid for on the cross, and simply by faith in Jesus Christ, 
you already belong to him. So I'm going to give the microphone to John Farnham, let him introduce his son, and then I'll be here to hold the mic when you dunk him. Thanks, buddy. Um, yeah, we, uh, this is Sean. This is my youngest. Um, we, in case you haven't run into us, we've been here for about three years. We moved from Atlanta. Um, Lauren and I celebrated our 15th wedding anniversary a couple days ago. Um, so we kind of came at a middle stage of life and uh, in case uh, you know you guys didn't see where these kids come from <laughs> so <laughs> we we baptized all these guys before and Sean's our last one to baptize here and this is a happy day for us um, and uh, yeah he's in second grade Could stand next to <laughs> So, Sean, let me ask you the questions. Can you turn a little bit? How have you come to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I prayed to him and told him I told him him I wanted to walk with him forever. Who is uh, Jesus Christ to you? What he means to me is he he is a loving God because he washed away my sins and died on the cross for me, too. And why do you want to be baptized today? Because I can tell my friends I'm a, I'm a Christian and how he died on the cross for me. Sean Clark Farnham, based upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, I baptize you in the name, or my, my son and brother in Christ, in the name of uh, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in the newness of life. Awesome, Sean. Way to go. Yeah, we do want to celebrate him. Uh, and the Farnhams have, are going to have a small reception. If you want to stop by and high-five Sean or hug him and just tell him great, great stuff, uh, it'll be in the student room right after worship. There'll be some refreshments in there if you want to stop by. So thank you, Farnhams, for in inviting us to that. At this time, our first through fourth graders are uh, dismissed to your kid's life class, and we will continue worship. So if you'll stand.
Your faithfulness 
put my faith in Jesus. If I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation, He'll never let me down. Let's do it again. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground. grateful that we can just uh, be reminded of your faithfulness in our lives, that we can uh, that we can celebrate baptism this morning and be reminded of your faithfulness through generations. And uh, God, we just, uh, I'm just grateful that we can hear each other's voices singing together and proclaiming uh, just who you are, God, to us, and that we can be uh, just comforted by your faithfulness. And God, that you, uh, we know that you call us to also walk in faithfulness to you and to, to be to live like your son Jesus and to uh, live the life that he has for us. And so, uh, God, we thank you for this morning. And uh, God, I pray that you be with us this morning, that we would hear from your word. And uh, Father, we love you and we'll trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. Hey, um, we are continuing this morning in our series on Colossians. And so, if you've got your copy of the Word of God or you've got a device with it, you are going to go to Colossians 3, uh, beginning in verse 18. Uh, and a couple of things. What we've learned uh, about the book of Colossians, the overarching message that we are taught is that Jesus Christ is supreme. He is preeminent. He is supposed to be and hopefully is the center of all of our lives. He is the one by which we revolve. We don't revolve around him. And he directs us because he alone is worthy of that type of direction. And so we've gone through up to this point, very theological, doctrinally um, heavy portion of the book of Colossians. And this morning we're transitioning into like a real practical application of what we have heard thus far. We're talking about family. We're talking about husbands. We're talking about wives. We're talking about parents. We're talking about kids. All the fun stuff. All right, so it's going to be a fun morning, and we're going to see directly what God would have for us. But let me just say this from the outset. You know and I know that there is a difference between having a house and a home. A house it's a structure. You might, you know, you live in an apartment, that's what you call your house. Or you live in a trailer, that's what you call your house. You live in a house house, that's what you call your house. But no matter what your structure is, the home is what's built amongst the people within. And so this morning, 
I absolutely 100% believe that what's going to happen here, as we really ingest and think through these words of God, that we are going to be um, inspired by the Spirit. I believe that we will be better equipped in all of these roles. So here's the deal. Let me just give you one example of somebody that has made their, you know what, I'm going to quit doing this. What's going on here? Is that me? All right, let's go try it again. It's probably the dang beard. All right, here we go. So let me give you one example of a couple who have uh, worked on a, on a marriage, on a home. This is the interview um, for, two, for two people, a couple named James and Virginia Wilson, married 63 years. They were asked this question, what's the secret to your marriage? Virginia says, communication. We try to communicate with each other. In our earliest years, he, meaning her husband James, was a band director for 40 years, which means that he was busy, busy, busy. And I was an elementary school teacher, so we had to communicate often. And then James says, to his, what is the secret to your marriage? He says, well, we, we love each other. And we come from parents who were church-going folk. And they taught us about marriage, and we respected them, so we had no problems. We lived the example they put forth before us. It's incredible, right? Next question is, how do you resolve conflict the best? Virginia says, talk it over. If you don't get it done today, talk about it in the morning, talk about it in the afternoon. And then James says, we have so few conflicts, we talk about it. She expresses her side, and I express mine. Next question to this, to this older couple. If there was one thing you wish you knew before marriage, what would it be? Virginia says, well, I had an example of my mom and dad. My dad was a country minister. I assume that's just a minister in a country town. I don't know what a country minister is, but anyway. My dad was a country minister, and they had six children, so I came up in a family of six, so we always saw that. And then James says, I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, my love with her for her was so strong, she couldn't do anything wrong. That's how he remembers his wife when they met. Last question on this couple building a home, not a house. What's your advice to younger couples, whether they're married or not? Virginia says, try to understand each other and try to not go to bed angry with each other. And then James finishes with this, trust in the Lord and trust in each other, and try to do the right thing all the time. The wrong thing is often more attractive, so be careful. It's good words right there from an older couple, been married 63 years. And so we get a little bit more... <laughs> we get a little bit more in depth this morning than just that, because those are all good things, right? Those are all good skills, good words, and um, but let's hear what the Apostle Paul says. Here's what God says to us. The title of this sermon uh, is Family Life in the Name of the Lord Jesus, and it comes in the context for verses 18 through 21, which we're going to dive into, uh, but it really comes from the verse right before. Colossians 3, 17 says this, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so this morning it is family life in the name of the Lord Jesus. And we'll see what God has for us in this. But before we get in, let me give you some disclaimers because I know that there are many people here from many different types of home situations, family situations. So the disclaimer here this morning is that we are looking at husbands and wives, parents and children. I know that you may be here wishing you were married and you weren't, married and wishing you have kids, but you don't. You may also just think back on your family growing up and it was a bad place to be. You might be having conflict in your family right now. You may, have, you may be a single parent type of a family situation, okay? And here's what I want you to understand is that we also refer to the church. I'm going to try to not move much. We, we also refer to the church as a church family. 
There's been amazing, um, one of the things that I love most about Allen Bible Church is how this church, this body, really is surrogate family to each other. Oh, it's very, very cool. And so I just want to say all that as a disclaimer. But today, we are going to look at um, really the, the four aspects of family that we find in verses 18 through 21. And so if that is your situation, and I think there's applicability for all of us, no matter what your situation, if that is your situation, you have to understand that strength comes in four, not necessarily in three. One thing that I have in my yard, one thing I have in my yard um, is I have an old school Honda red three-wheeler. There it is. That sits in my yard. Meredith took that picture yesterday after it quit raining. I love that so much. So fun. And if you are as old as I am or older, you may have had lots of good times on three-wheelers back in the late 70s, early 80s. And uh, fantastic. That thing still runs most of the time. I got to do a little bit of work on it. Uh, But man, totally fun. But here's what happened. Those things went away. They went away because there was a uh, there was a, a trick with them. <laughs> People were getting really hurt and died a lot, you know, on these things, because they were super unstable. Uh, that's why when I when I drive around on it now, I just take it as you know, I just kind of cruise on it, I'm not doing anything too radically crazy on it, because when you're riding those things fast, you really have to lean the right way and all the stuff, you know, because otherwise that thing's gonna flip. So in in 1987. I had to look this up, so I remember it happened at some point, and I didn't remember the details, but here's what went down. 1987, Honda, who was making all these things, they quit making them because of these safety concerns. Look, <laughs> the 80s were a different time, am I right? I mean, we didn't even, we didn't even really believe in the safety of seatbelts back then, okay? But it was different times, safety concerns, they quit making them. Uh, U.S. Department of Justice, um, they banned them. They banned the sale and production of three-wheelers, and they made an agreement with another governmental agency, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and they financed a $100 million safety campaign, and they bought back all the unsold three-wheelers, and so they just went away. Still got mine, you know? Government can't take it. You know, come and take it, right? What do we say? Yeah. <laughs> can't take it. Don't tread on me. I got my three-wheeler. There we go. Uh, and so here's the deal. That government agreement was a 10-year agreement. And, but once 10 years had passed, they didn't try to produce three-wheelers anymore. Why? Because the four-wheeler took over. The popularity of the four-wheeler made it like, why would we produce more three-wheelers? That's what was there. And so here's why four-wheelers are a better vehicle. Two things. They hold more weight, they bear more weight, and they're more stable. And so as we look at these four aspects of family today, yeah, we might, we're talking about husbands, maybe the husband's not all in, or the wife's not all in, or the kids aren't all in, whatever. And when the, that kind of a family that we're speaking about this morning, when all four play, there's stability, you can bear more weight, and it's just better. And I believe that's actually true of, of life in general, even outside the family. The more people we could have around us, I just think the more stable we are. So that's what we look at today. Um, and what we learned about... Um, Colossians, Jesus is preeminent, and through him we can have new life. And having new life, we become new men, new husbands, new women, new wives, new kids, new parents. We become new, and then we can then have new families. So real quick, just four verses, and we're just going to skim the surface of these different family roles this morning. But if you would look at me, look with me, at... uh, (laughs) Don't look at me if you don't want, I don't care. Look at the Bible, though. Uh, Verse 18 through 21, Colossians 3, let me just read it. Read along with me. It says this, Wives, submit to your husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. There we are. Four quick verses, but those verses are loaded. And the first thing that we look at, the first will, if you will keep going with me on that analogy, is wives. Wives are addressed addressed first, and here it is. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting to the Lord, or as fitting in the Lord. Um, Those are fighting words, aren't they? Yep. 
lot of people don't like those. A lot of people don't like that right there. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. But here's the thing. I want to say real quickly and real strongly that this does not mean that wives are less than husbands. And I also want to say, as we go through wives and husbands here, let me just be crystal clear that this does not say that women should submit to men. That is not what we're saying here. All women should submit to all men by no means. We are talking about within the household model here, we're talking about wives and husbands within that relationship. And here's what we know about these verses. The Apostle Paul actually is elevating women in this because in a second we'll see how he also refers to husbands because there is now, their wives have a role, they have a duty, and so do husbands, okay? They have a role as well, and we'll get there. But at this point in time, man, not a whole lot was talked about as far as what's the husband's responsibility, because women were not looked highly upon at all. Jewish men could, could divorce their wives at any point in time for any reason, but Jewish women couldn't do it, you know? You had a lot of that sort of thing. And then so Paul then says he's going to address both husbands and wives because they both have roles to fulfill. Now, this verse, and there's, an, there's, other, there's corollary verses, and we'll refer to some of them in Ephesians chapter 5 and right at the beginning of chapter 6. These verses um, can cause me um, to be pretty angry um, because I have seen personally, personally have seen it, um, men who are spiritual men, Christian men, and just want to pluck a verse out like this without getting anything else about themselves and hold it over their wives, and um, they become abusive. Abusive couch potato type men drives me crazy. So may we not do that. And again, just stay with me here for the next handful of minutes, and we will see this. But we have to, this whole thing of submission, we have to get a good working definition of submission. Um, and here it is. Let's, let's, we'll, it'll be on the screen. The word submit uh, is the Greek word hupotasso. And, here it's, and what it, here's what it means. Voluntarily. Key word, voluntarily, relinquishing your rights to nurture what is good in another and in the relationship. It is to choose to put yourself under leadership. This definition that's on your screen is the definition that I've been running with for many, many years because it can get a little bit complicated. And doing premarital counseling, and I do a, a good bit of that, it is, okay, so what does that actually mean? Does that mean that there's a difference in, um, you know, priority level um, or strength or whatever, or degree of husbands and wives? It is super strong for anybody to choose to voluntarily put themselves under the leadership of another. It is voluntarily relinquishing your rights. How cool is it? You see, there is a difference between this word submit because submit has nothing to do with slavery or anything else. We will get to children and the word obey. This is a totally different word. Submission is voluntarily choosing to relinquish your rights to nurture what is good in another and in the relationship. So it is about functionality of the marriage. Now, if you are still a little bit confused about this thing of submission, does this mean that there is a lesser degree or lesser value upon the one that submits? Um, let me give you a great example. Best example I think we can give is out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, where it says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Here was, here's what Paul says next. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of man is Christ, the head of the wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. The head of Christ is God. Let me ask you a question. Is God the Son? inferior to God the Father? Everybody say no. No, 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 no. That would be a heretical statement to make, for we absolutely believe 
in the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, equal. And because of the way that it's set up amongst God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, there is an, an order there. So nobody, no part of the Trinity, is a better way to say it, is inferior to the other. So imitate, be imitators of me as I am Christ. And so let's, let's dive a little bit further into how do we imitate Christ. Um, go to Philippians 2, I think verses there. Yeah, Philippians 2, 5 through 7 says this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Here it is, who, in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied, who? emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Hear that, see that. He emptied himself. There is no coercion. There is a choice of strength. And then we move forward in the life of Jesus when we get to the Garden of Gethsemane. And then what does he say? Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And he doesn't really go, oh, don't want to really want to go there. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Oh, what a great example, huh? That's what we get. So this submission that we speak of is not inferiority. It is functionally submitting to what God has called us to do and who he has called us to be. Now, also on this verse here, and we're going quickly to husbands. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Okay, that right there tells me that there is a limit on submission. Think about it for a second. You know, if a wife goes, okay, husband, I want to submit to you, and then the husband says, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're never going to church again because I don't like it. Okay, well, okay, well, yes, yeah, I'm going to submit to you. Or, you know, the alcoholic husband says, hey, go down and buy me a pack of beer. Or, you know, let's, uh, let's go get drunk together. No, 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 there's a limit to submission. Submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. And we see a corollary principle of this in Acts chapter 5 when we're thinking about government and the Christian, where it says, you know, what's going on there is the apostles or in this town, and they say, hey, you can't, you can't preach here. And then what is, what is written? We must obey God rather than men. So there is a limit. We're going to obey God first, and wives are, here's what we called, that voluntarily out of strength, submitting to the leadership of your husband as it is fitting in the Lord. But we also need to know this. There's a lot of couples where the wife you just need to help your guy a little bit, okay? You need to help your guy. Because uh, I see a lot of people, um, young couples growing up in the church, and then the, uh, the bride-to-be will go, I just want him to be a spiritual leader in our home. I'm like, all right, great. And I look at the guy and go, what does that mean? What does that actually look like? You know, let me get all kind of conversations. But couples that are married, sometimes the wife will say, I want him to be the spiritual leader. And then she, the wife also says at the same time, but I'm not following that lead. <laughs> you know, it's like, you got a problem, right? I'll never forget, um, some of us in this room even, we were at, um, we went to, used to go to Pine Cove Family Camp back when the kids were little. And if you get to Pine Cove Family Camp, here's what happens. You see a lot of the people there that you haven't seen in a year. And I remember a, um, a couple from Baton Rouge who was there one year. And, you know, they, when we go around, it's like, okay, all the kids are doing something, and the parents kind of go around and just say, hey, just tell us, tell us what's, what happened in this past year. What can we pray about? What do you hope happens this week? What do you hope God does? And that wife stood up and said, I need to be more submissive to my husband. As her husband said right there, I'm like, okay, this is day one. I'm like, all right, here we go. I need to be more submissive to my husband. The Lord has convicted me of this. I have a really tough time with this. This is because of the way that I grew up and because of my temperament. But he's here, and, he's, and she looked at him, and then she started crying. And, you know, it's like she's trying so hard, and I just, need to, I just need to trust in that. I need to trust in the Lord to do this more because that's what I hope to get out of this week. I'm like, okay. You know, it's like, well, how do you follow that, right? But it was an amazing, amazing testimony from that woman, that wife. That's one will. One will is wives. Let's go to the second will. Husbands, verse 19 says this, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. 
Your version may say, don't be embittered with them. And so that whole thing, if you think about what would cause a husband to be harsh or to be embittered anyway, a lot of times it is through, um, it's through lack of reconciliation, through lack of really dealing with conflict well, and some of it's probably tied up in this submission, and who has, uh, probably all of that stuff. But here's the deal. Do not be harsh with them. And what's, what's interesting here is we see this command, this imperative for husbands to love their wives. Nowhere do we see here or elsewhere wives commanded to love their husbands. Isn't that interesting? I think it's interesting. Now, I hope the wives love their husbands. That's much better, right? But we get the submit, we get the respect in Ephesians 5. Uh, but here we have husbands, love your wives. Because I love the balance here. Because God, in his wisdom, has given husbands the, the lead here. Wives, submit to your husbands that we just read. And so, man, you know how a husband needs to employ that? You know, he, he needs to love his wife. Because that changes the whole dynamic. If the husband is loving his wife well, then that whole submission thing is not nearly as complicated, you know? Um, that's how I see it. So it's, it's, a, it's a balance of leadership and affection. Um, but here's what I want to do. So we just get, it's pretty short words here, you know? It's like, husbands, love your wives and don't be harsh with them. So but we get another little bit of help about how husbands love wives in, in Ephesians 5, verse 25. Key phrase here that helps us, where it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. How does Christ love the church? So if you are a dude, a husband, and going, okay, yeah, well, I submit to me, mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, right there. <laughs> love your wives as Christ loved love the church and gave himself up for her because Christ loved the church sacrificially, unconditionally, and without reciprocity. Think about that for a second. You know, when Christ died for the church, did he go, I'm doing this because of all the cool things I'm getting back. Uh, you know, uh, here's the deal. Without reciprocity, and we see this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's huge. So if you are going to, husbands, love your wives, that's a, that's a pretty high standard, okay? Pretty high standard. And a lot of times husbands will say things like this, you know, I'll take a bullet from my wife. Yeah, I'll do. But you won't, some, you, won't, you won't give in on some other smaller things, but you'll take the bullet, but you won't do this, right? Um, you know, it's interesting that we really struggled with this, or let me just say, I, yeah, I think Meredith and I both struggled, but I'm going to talk about me. Um, early on in marriage, I, you know, I was in a, um, I, was, I moved from what I call, what I thought was a, a cool apartment. I was living with, uh, living on a futon uh, with beautiful thing, couldn't afford the waterbed, so I had, you know, couch by day bed by night. It was an amazing thing. And, um, and next thing I know, I get married, and um, that's, I start to see a lot of, like, Laura Ashley floral stuff coming into my place. And then, you know, I had this great, I had two great pictures, framed, matted. Oh, it was amazing. Dogs playing pool and dogs playing poker. You know those classic prints? <laughs> I don't know why you laugh. Those were awesome. Uh, but then you mentor into marriage. You go, hey, what? <laughs> We're part of the in the main room we put knees, you know, and like, well, we're not putting those up. I was like, oh, all right, all right, and then it's like, okay, so there's a little bit of a struggle. So this is a really test case here. Um, yeah, think about it. It's like, okay, so I'm 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 losing out on some things, and you know, I'm not really thinking through to be honest. I'm just brand new married, don't know anything at all. But thinking through, okay, so I've I've given up the futon. We got some a lot of floral stuff laying around here now, and my dogs playing pool and poker. They're gone, and um, okay, you know sorting through the tension, and then we get um, what I think is going to be, aha, here we go. We get a, we get a wedding gift. Um, and this is back in the uh, mid-90s. A family friend of Meredith gives us a pretty big Waterford crystal bowl. Yeah, all right. I'm going, that's dumb. <laughs> you know, I, I looked it up, man. I got that from Dillard's, and it costs like $300. You know, I'm serious. And I'm going, well, obviously, we're returning this. We're going to buy a TV or something with that money, right? And um, no, I lost that one, too. <laughs> you know, we, um, yeah, it was just tough. I was just getting dinged all over the place. I wasn't even quite aware what was going on. But 
you know, I felt like um, if we don't have this big water for Crystal Bowl, we need to we need to do something good with it, you know. So, um, still in the first month of, of marriage, I think I had some friends over and. We're um, watching something on the small TV because we couldn't afford a big TV because we didn't return the bowl. Um, but then, um, so Meredith and I are still in the heat of this conversation, get it, right? We're still in the heat of it. Uh, but she's back in the back of the little apartment that we're living in, and we're all eating cereal, milk. I got a bowl for that. <laughs> yeah, water for crystal bowl, milk, cereal, wooden spoon. I'm making, I'm making a point here. And uh, then Meredith comes out and sees it. Yeah. Just saw the eyes, you know. I was like, "Guys, we gonna have to go." <laughs> you know, y'all go see y'all next week. And that was uh, still to this day, 28 years into it, one of the biggest fights we ever got into. I mean, I was just, you know, whatever. Just younger and dumber, you know, whatever. But here's the thing. But my whole thing, what was my issue there? It was really with felt like I was losing my place, and that was right. That was just kind of like one of the first marital illustrations, examples of, you know, how does this thing go? And if I'm really thinking about God's word here that we just, you know, unpacked a little bit, you know, loving my wives as Christ loved the church. I mean, come on, it's just a bowl. It's just money. It's just a picture or two pictures, actually, whatever. It's just a thing, you know. It's like it's not that big of a deal, right? So my job as a husband is to love my wife sacrificially, unconditionally, and sometimes without reciprocity, if I'm being honest. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just kidding. But that is my job. Um, that's the job of every husband, um, and it's not easy. It's complicated, um, but you know what I love about this is the context of Ephesians 5.25. Um, you can go and look at it. it uh, Ephesians 5.15 says this. It says, I don't know if I even got these on slides. I don't think we do. Um, Ephesians 5.15 says, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, and that is Paul talking to the church, we're not talking about husbands and wives here. We're talking to the church. Look carefully how you walk. walk. Walk wise, not as unwise. And then a few verses down, Ephesians 5, 20 and 21 says, Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hear this. Remember, talking to the church. Submitting to one another. Okay? That's back and forth. That's reciprocity. Submitting to one another, not because they're, people are really cool and deserve it, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Because of your relationship with the Lord, because of our relationship with the Lord, we submit to each other. And then, so that's the context of that verse, and then Paul jumps in and gives the specifics illustrations in marriage. So it's under the umbrella of this mutual submission, submitting one to the other out of reverence for Christ. And then he goes into, kind of like what we're seeing here in Colossians, he goes into wives, follow the lead of your husbands, and husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. What a great example of what he's speaking about right there. Eugene Peterson, um, in his paraphrase, the message of this verse here in Colossians, I like the way he renders it. He says, husbands, go all out in your love for your wives. Husbands, go all out in your, loves for, in your love for your wives. Can you just imagine what it would look like if every husband, me included, just went all out in love for our wives? How cool would that be? Now, when we start thinking about love, I think a lot of you know this, but we need to understand when we see love here, it is a commitment. It is a command. It is so much more than a feeling. I know we say that often, but we need to be reminded of that because I've seen and you've seen a lot of marriages fall apart because they just fell out of love, you know, whatever. They just don't get along anymore. Man, there was, what, the vows that you take till death do you part, you know what that means? Till death do you part, <laughs> you know? It's like, you know, there it is. And so that's a commitment in a Christian marriage. It's a covenant with God and a covenant with your partner. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. So we need to be fully, fully aware of that. Biblical love is far deeper than any sort of, like, fleeting emotion. All right, we're two wheels in. Let's pick up the pace. Third wheel of this four-wheeled vehicle is children. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. This is the third wheel. Remember, we're looking for stability. We're looking for a family unit to hold weight here. And the third wheel of this four-wheeled vehicle, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. And the word used here for um, children is technon, which refers to children of any age. 
So we're really speaking about children, specifically more here in this context, children that are still living under the roof, financial support of their parents. We're not just talking about little kids, because sometimes, oh, that means like little kids, when the kids are little, no, no, there's a different word, padilla for that. Children of any age living under the household of your parents, obey, obey them. So if you're living at home, that's what you can understand, it's, it's a good thing, it's what you do. And you know, the best example, the best example that I can think about of not just obedience, but if you go to the next, I call it an attitudinal shift, we also see the words, the phrase, not here in this text, children, honor your parents, honor your parents. Let's go to see Ephesians 6, 1, where it says, children, we've got obey your parents in the Lord for this is right, Ephesians 6, 1. But we also get honor your parents, Paul talks about in the book of Ephesians, which refers back to the fifth commandment in the Big Ten, right? First Ten Commandments. We get this, it's the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you. So, we have, so what does it mean? So if you honor your parents, if you hold them in esteem because of who the Lord is, not because they're perfect, then you're going to have a much more um, strong inclination, I should say, to obey. So when you honor, you obey. And there's, here's what Jesus does. When Jesus is on the cross and he is going through agonizing pain, in the middle of that, you know what he does? He thinks about somebody else. You know what he thinks about? He thinks about his mother. That dude is up on the cross. He is going through all the torture, taking on the sin of the world. And that guy looks at his mother and looks at the guy standing beside her, which we believe is the Apostle John, and he says to his mother, what does he say? He says, this is your son. This is your mother. Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. You know what he's establishing there? That after he's gone, that his mom is still going to be honored. He's making sure she's taken care of in the middle of the torture. It's a big deal. What a great example of honoring. So honor. Children, obey your parents. Again, Ephesians 6, 1, easier, right? Why you do it? Because it's right. It's the right thing to do, <laughs> you know? Do the right thing. Let me give you two, two reasons. Kids, if you're a child living in the home of your parents right here, I want you to look at me because this is about you specifically. First reason why you need to obey your parents is not, not, not directly in the text right here is because you are expensive. You are. You know, you cost a lot of stinking money. I saw a survey that says, man, raising a kid from birth to... 18, like, cost you well over $300,000. That's a lot of money. And it, I think that might be a little short. But anyway, kids, you're expensive, so obey your parents. Understand what I'm saying to you? Yeah. Get it? See you? See you? Obey your parents. And look, and if you don't want to, if you're living in the household of your parents, in the household of your parents you want to obey, pay them back. Give them the money back, all right? You know? Parents go, where we got amen right there, huh? All right. You're expensive, but more than that, it is pleasing to the Lord, and it is just doggone right. It pleases the Lord, okay? That's why we do what we do. Okay, that's three wills. we got to hustle. Let's get to the fourth will here. Um, the fourth will is this. It is um, parents, and the verse here is verse 21. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Now, another translation for the Greek word pateras could be parents, and we get it, like, you know, what it's just the fathers and not the most. In other words, the principle here is parents. This is the fourth will. It is mom and dad in a, in a mom and dad system. It is a single mom in a single mom system. It is a single dad in a single dad system, whatever it is. Parents is the fourth will. Here's what it says. It says, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. The job of a parent, I believe, is like the hardest job ever. It is taxing emotionally, spiritually even, physically for sure. I mean, it's just a tough job. For the parents who love their kids, because it just, it's too quick. you know it, it just doesn't always work out like you hoped it would, you know, on a day-by-day -day basis. And so that's why it requires a lot of faith um, I love being a parent, love being a father. I uh, hope to be a grandfather one day, and in the middle of this, you know, between now and then, if, if that day even comes, is 
I love being a part of this church because I get to be part of a life group. Got a lot of little babies. You know, I love that. Um, hold those babies, love those babies. Um, and then spend a lot of time with our fifth and sixth graders here over the last couple of years. Man, what a blessing that is to listen to these guys and gals come in on a weekly basis and talk about their weeks and what's going on and what's really on their hearts. I mean, just it's an amazing. So I get to kind of be a surrogate parent uh, while I miss my own kids, you know, adults out there in Louisiana. I love it. I do. And my job there, what is my job? Is to, as a surrogate parent, I just want to encourage them, right? I want to, I want to hold those babies. I want to make them laugh. I want to you know, hang out with the kids. I'm trying to encourage. Because our job as parents overall, right, is to not provoke them. We don't want them to be discouraged. So the positive is may they be encouraged. That's the deal. And look, it still goes on. I had a tough, tough decision to make. Um, made it last week, week before. And it really, the decision pertained to what I was going to do with my day and evening yesterday. Because as you see me, here I stand. So, you know, I don't preach here. Every, I preach here every so often. So I'm preaching on Sunday. Um, and, but my son, uh, he and I have a, a good connection. He's 22. We have a good connection around music. Um, I've brought him up. Uh, bless him. I brought him up on music that I was brought up on, you know. And um, we've gone to many a concert together. And it's just fun that we can grab it. We listen to all kind of music. But bringing him up on music that I grew up on, um, he lets me know a couple weeks ago, Dad, because I had a birthday recently, he goes, Dad, I got a surprise for you. Uh, what you got, son? I got us some concert tickets. I got us a concert ticket, two concert tickets to um, a country artist that, you know, again, I grew up on. And like, awesome, son. Where is it? Well, it's in, it's in Treeport. Well, uh, three hours, I'll come do it three hours down. What is it? Oh, it's on Saturday, um, yeah, it's on Saturday the, the 20th. I'm like, <laughs> okay. And it's like, hey, then let me, uh, let me give that a little thought because I'm preaching that next time. He goes, okay, Dad. I said, did you already buy the tickets? Oh, yeah, Dad, I already bought them. Okay. All right. Super thoughtful. And so what's my decision? I don't think there's really a wrong decision here. I could have easily said, look, son, I got preaching on Sunday. I just can't make it, man. I can't get down there and get back, in, you know, back into Dallas at the wee hours of the morning because I could give him great reasons, right? And then I just kind of played this out. I'm going, okay, I'm, what's your sermon on, Dad? Well, I just don't want to discourage my, my children. <laughs> like, dang, you know, what do you do with that? So I said, yes, all right? So he calls me and goes, Dad, what are you going to do? And he can tell the concert, it was really pressing on him because he already bought the tickets. And so I said to him something along the lines of, I can skin a buck, I can run a trot line, I can do the drive, I can do the time. All right, we'll do it. We're, we're in. And if you know, you know. So anyway, so I, I went to that concert, and um, man, it was the right call. I've spent a lot of time with that kid yesterday. He's 22, not a kid, but um, he says to me, he said, Dad, I can't believe you're preaching tomorrow, but you're here. I went, so I'm thankful to be here. And then um, as we were parting last night, last verse, Dad, thank you so much for coming. He spent his own money and bought these tickets, and he thanked me. I mean, it's just, poof, man. I look, I go, okay. I could have easily made the other choice, and it wouldn't have been a wrong choice, but, man, I, just felt, I felt good about it. But here's the deal. I feel like that's the right decision. Let me tell you all the wrong decisions I made. I'm going to tell you, I can, we don't have time, right? We don't have time. Parents, as you are trying to not provoke your children so that they become discouraged, you want them to be encouraged, and then they, they grow up, and then there's always, even whether they're in the house or they're out of the house, it just comes a lot of self-doubt. Did I do it right? Did I should have done this? Blah, blah, blah. You know, did they eat enough vegetables? I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's like, what do you do? I mean, honestly, I had lunch with my son yesterday, and I forgot that I raised a kid in South Louisiana for most of his childhood years, and he doesn't like rice. What's wrong with that? He gets that from his mama. That's, that's her fault, and that's real. <laughs> That's real. But, you know, it's like you have these self-doubt. You just do what you can. Some things are out of control, right? You can't, I, couldn't, I can't make that kid like rice. can't make it. On a bigger scale, you know, for Christian parents, we want our kids to follow the Lord, to be obedient to him. And it's hard because a lot, oftentimes they don't, you know. There's self-doubt that creeps in. And let me just tell you this. I mean, one story that I will always remember is, make it super quick, back in the day, um, at, another, at a different church, there was, I was doing student ministry, and there was a young woman who went to one of those private schools where you take the ethics code, and you can get kicked out of school for things you did on the weekend while you weren't at school, okay? And she was really giving herself into some immorality and wasn't trying to hide it. And 
I'm, I'm um, overseeing, uh, facilitating a parenting class. I mean, my kids are like this. I don't know anything about it. But I'm facilitating a class, not leading it. And the mom of that young lady, she got kicked out of school. She got expelled. And a uh, small Christian community, everybody knew about it. And so that mom stands up in this parenting class and says, uh, hey, a lot of you know what's going on here with um, my daughter. And she said, I've been struggling. Like, what did I do wrong? Okay. She keeps asking her, what did I do wrong? And I know this family, know this mom. I go, man, I think they did a lot of things right. And then she said this, and this is a word of encouragement I've always th thought about. She said, but she goes, would I go back to Adam and Eve in the garden who their circumstances were perfect? And what they do? Chose sin anyway, okay? So you have to recognize that, yeah, our job is to be disciples of our children, but does that automatically guarantee things? It does not. So kids, let me just tell you this, for those of you who are still here, it's like, still paying attention, your, your faith, your relationship with the Lord, that's you, okay? Um, the way that you decide to be obedient to the Lord or not, that's you, okay? You can go, yeah, but my parents didn't do that. Yeah, 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 let me just tell you this. I can think I can speak pretty confidently about most, if not all the parents of the kids in this room. Your parents are doing their best they can, really, with the tools that they've got. It's not easy. They mess up, give them a break, because you do it as well. It's just, it's, it's that fourth will, you know? It's that third will of parents. Kids, I just want you to obey your parents. They're trying hard. And parents, I want you to do the best you can to not provoke them, to be encouragers and not discouragers, you know? And here's the deal, because we can't, there's things we can't control. Can't make my son like rice. I can't make my kids be, follow the Lord, you know? Whatever, there's things like that. But then since Paul puts this in the negative, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Let me tell you some negative things that we could do that would make it, that would actually work against our vision for our kids obeying the Lord. The first thing is if we have, I don't have this on a list, just rattle them off. Hypocrisy, you know, you show up on church looking like this, you know, certain, you know it's that hypocrisy kids see it at a young age. It, it's really, it's, it's a hard thing for kids to, to deal with. Second thing I'll put there is inconsistency, you know. Oh, you know, I can't believe you dropped that fork on the floor. Now I'm mad at you. And then, you know, you set the house on fire the next day, you go, it's not, not that big of a deal. It's that inconsistency thing, that consistent discipline. There's studies after studies that go that kids need that consistency. Um, criticism, we, I think all of us, we think about one critical remark uh, more than we think about all the positive remarks that we get. And so kids especially can lose hope. Um, and it's like, I think there was a study back at some point, I can't remember, but the exact numbers, but one critical remark needs to be like, you know, in the middle of a, like, I don't know, five, six, seven positive remarks so that kids don't lose hope. Uh, another thing is, you know, that is you can, your kids can become discouraged. They can be, can, they can be provoked uh, by overcommitment. You just got to, you're too busy and they feel like they're just kind of, your life is your job and they're just kind of in there bugging you every now and then, right? That overcommitment thing domineering, and I don't just mean being dominant like harsh, but some parents are just too much in their kid's world, um, and looks at it, one of the best things a parent can do is step back, quit trying to take control, let those kids experience those consequences, because that's growing up. Some parents know they're dominant, they're in all the time, and that could cause a problem. Another one, um, I'll just leave it on this last one here, um, minimizing, um, I've got more, but we don't have time, minimizing, ah, no big deal. That's been my big thing. That was, that's, that's, that was one of my problems as my daughter grew up. My daughter, who's fantastic, she's 24, got to spend a little bit of time with her on Friday. Um, she sees a counselor, which I um, em encourage everybody to have a counselor. Obviously, you've had somebody uh, that you've met with in case you get in the problem, you know, have a relationship with a trusted person, not just any counselor. That could be more dangerous and more harmful than good. But she has a good relationship with a trusted counselor. And... Um, Sometime last year, she was, after she met with her counselor, um, she called me, my daughter did, and she goes, Deb, I met with the counselor today, and she goes, you know how I have a, a struggle with, you know, making decisions and uh, really thinking that, um, you know, my feelings are valid. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I understand. She goes, no, the counselor told me it was all your fault. <laughs> and she was joking. Kind of. I went, and I, I said to her, baby, I was just waiting for that phone call. I mean, I know. I guess it's waiting for it. all my fault. She laughed, and she goes, no, she goes, but part of it was, he's like, yeah, whenever I think she was having a problem, I just go, my typical demeanor is problems are just not that big of a deal. So I gave her that message of not a big deal, not a big deal. So somehow that caused her to maybe mistrust her feelings a little bit about what she's thinking. Anyway, that conversation finished with that. It's not that big of a deal. <laughs> so 
wait a minute, wait, so, what? so she flipped it back, we both laughed, like, so you, I, okay, whatever, she's like, it's not that big of a deal, she goes, uh, she, I know you tried your best, and that's like, she was, she was really, that was a fun laughing conversation, you have to understand the, temp, uh, the temperature of that, um, it was awesome, let me give you this, real quickly, land in the plane, this fourth will, quick definition of a parent, a parent is a partner with God in making disciples of children, that's that's, that's, that's a definition. That's my working definition. And you see it all over the place. I love that this passage this morning landed on this baptismal morning where we got to see John baptize Sean. Uh, very cool. Um, John and Lauren Farnham, uh, you guys do a good job. I was going to say it out loud. I know you'd hate that, but yeah. These guys um, are about that. Um, I, I get to work with their older kids on Wednesday nights. And it's just fun to be part of a, of a church body where a lot of these folks, we're, look, we're looking at this, this fourth wheel of parenting. I know that's very intentional. Um, anyway, so I hope that this morning um, you just think about where you are on those four wheels, husband, wife, child, parent. Um, and let's pray that God helps us. Let's pray together as the worship team comes on up. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you that um, you have given us your word. You have set our feet on solid ground with who you are. Um, you are supreme. You are number one. You are central. And you alone are worthy of that place in our lives. And so, Lord, as you have become that for many of us, most of us, uh, you have given us the opportunity for transformed life. You've given us the opportunity to become new husbands, new wives, new children, new parents. You've given us the opportunity, Lord, um, to live a life within our families to your glory. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen. You are invited to stand with us and sing.